as you climbed down the ladder, you knew this was the most powerful weapon system ever put on Earth. And they turn keys and the door snaps open. It first shoots a smoke ring out of the launch facility. You, you can kind of feel the air, the rumble in the air. It moves your chest. You can feel it in your chest. It's creating so much thrust. And you can still hear it crackling as it goes up. In the closing months of the Second World War, two new weapons appeared, the atomic bomb and the guided missile. Our army has undertaken an extensive project to perfect and build guided missiles capable of carrying an atomic warhead. The result of combining nuclear weapons with guided rockets were Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, which were capable of detonating multi-kiloton nuclear warheads at targets across the globe. The missile first moves straight up under the combined thrust of all engines. At a certain distance above the Earth, it is programmed into a tilt, which aims it into a curve or arc, calculated to intersect the Earth some 5,500 miles away. The ability for the U.S. and the USSR to start a nuclear conflict that could possibly destroy humanity led to a long-running war of deterrence. The concept behind nuclear weapons, the mission of nuclear weapons, is deterrence. We want to deter other people from misbehaving. We really don't want to use them but we want them in their brain that they know we can hurt them badly. You start a war, we are killing you, guaranteed. The U.S. Air Force's Strategic Air Command, or SAC, took control of Francis E. Warren Air Force Base near Cheyenne, Wyoming in 1958, deploying some of the first ICBM Atlas missiles. As the power and accuracy of intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, increased, newer missiles were being kept in underground silos called launch facilities where they would be protected from nuclear attack and other threats. Underground launch control facilities where missileers would carry out launch orders if necessary were also being built for the 200 newer Minutemen missiles that would eventually call F.E. Warren home. Quebec One was one of roughly 15 missile alert facilities spread across the high plains of Wyoming, north and east of Cheyenne. Uh, Quebec One was the closest missile alert facility to F.E. Warren, so it was great duty. It was only 25 minutes down the road or so, 30 minutes down the road. By the 1980s, Quebec One consisted of the Missile Alert Facility, or MAF, complete with a flight security controller's office, kitchen, dining room, sleeping area, and a maintenance garage. Below ground was the launch control facility, or capsule, where missileers would remotely maintain and control the missiles in their silos nearby. In the late 1980s, we were responsible for 950 nuclear weapons at that time. F.E. Warren was the most powerful combat unit in the West, probably the world. We asked former missileers what it was like pulling up to Quebec One to serve an alert. You would pull up to the gate. It would look like your typical farm building, only with a whole bunch of antennas. And he would go through a series of authentications with the on-duty flight security controller. If he decides that you're legitimate, then you could approach the gate, uh, open the gate, drive onto the site, and there was a door that went from the flight security controller's office into the area where you would enter the elevator. Well, you can see when you come down the elevator, is there's a big blast door. It's open from the inside. The crew's the only people who can open that because they're in there. Yeah, much of it was, was designed to fight in and through a nuclear war. So you had a capsule that was sitting on what we call shock isolators. Uh, and those shock isolators were akin to the shock absorbers in your car. And the concept was that if a weapon detonated three or five miles away, whatever the case might be, uh, that those shock absorbers would ab absorb the shock and you could maintain your presence in your chair at, at your console so that you could turn the key if necessary. The, the seats are actually old aircraft seats, but worked well here. And you would strap in because you knew that the concussion of an incoming detonation of a nuclear weapon could throw you out of the seat. If you took a direct hit, shock isolators and the seat belts were not going to do anything for you. But if there was a hit relatively close, it, they could keep you in your seat so that you could actually do your job. An important part of assuming an alert was for the incoming missileers to check all equipment in the capsule, including the sealed authenticator system documents. One of the devices inside the launch control center is a red box 
And in that red box are the, we call them the sealed authenticators. The sealed authenticator system documents, those are the actual documents we would use to authenticate a message from the president. You inventory those documents, and then after you do that, you return them to the red safe, the red box. You know you own this responsibility when your lock clicks on that red box. It, it takes about an hour to do an accurate changeover where you get briefed on the status of the missiles, you inventory the classified, you do everything you need to do, you, you exchange the weapons, and then you sign for the alert. That takes about an hour. We looked at every single piece of equipment, every light, every switch to make sure it was in the right position. That's an overly simplified sequence of events, but that's, uh, that's effectively how you started your alert. You'd be down there for anywhere from 24 to 36 hours until your relief crew came out the next day. The question arises, what did missileers do in a capsule during a quiet alert? On a typical very quiet alert, you would then use the time uh, to study procedures. You had a lot of time to work on uh, professional uh, military education, your master's program. Sometimes you could get access to local television stations using the antennas upstairs. Many times you couldn't. What I understand to be the case now is there's access to the internet, which was unheard of in our day. And uh, we always had uh, a VCR topside, and so we could bring a, a VCR tape with us and tell the FSC, I'll give you a call and I want you to put this movie in. In my time, we had no TV, no radio. All we had was books that you would bring. So I, I started catching up on the reading that I had deferred for years and years, like F. F, F Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. Before Quebec One and other MAFs enjoyed the services of an on-site chef, food options for service members on alert were more limited. Well, the food in my time was, uh, it was called foil packs. And what they were is frozen food in foil type containers. It was, it was kind of like a, a TV dinner. And a foil pack really wasn't that bad. It really wasn't. You would have a foil pack of lasagna, spaghetti. Chicken, beef, different types of potatoes, uh, french fries. I wouldn't say it was great, but it was, it was good. It was adequate. And spaghetti and peas, I liked them. <laughs> While monitoring the status of missiles, missileers also had to react to security breaches that would trigger alarms in the security system. Most of the time, that was a coyote or a fox or a rabbit. If on the other hand, there was an inner zone security violation. That usually meant that somebody was there tinkering with the access plug uh, to the actual launch facility, and that would increase the pucker factor. The MAF also housed security forces personnel who protected the missiles and responded to alarms. It's going to take you a lot longer to get in there than it's going to take us to be there. If we go out there and we can take you off of the site, that's great. If we can't, we'll obliterate the top of the site. We're talking grenade launchers, heavy machine guns. It's not going to get through to the missiles, so we don't care. We're going to just level the place. You're not leaving with a nuke. We asked former missileers about the public's reaction to the missiles. Fortunately, not often, but it did occur where we would have protesters that would breach the security of a, of a launch facility. We've responded a few times to protests, most of the time scheduled, and you don't, you don't play when they're scheduled. You go out there, you stand in line, you let them do what they need to do, and then you, you very respectfully escort them off. I know there were some nuns who continually tried to break onto a launch facility where a missile is down in Colorado. U.S. troops cannot arrest civilians. It's called posse comitatus. We are not allowed to do that. So we, we can detain, and then the local sheriff, somebody not part of the military can arrest them. Well, they arrested these nuns several times. Finally, the judge got mad and threw them in jail. Much of the land where launch facilities were placed was purchased by the government from local ranchers and farmers. The, the most interesting thing I think I ever came across uh, was in talking to some of the farmers on whose property these launch facilities are, and they had a more nuanced understanding of how deterrence works than a lot of the people that I interacted with uh, at uh, at a certain university in Cambridge, Massachusetts when I was working on a master's degree. In other words, our farmers out there understood the weapon system and understood what it did for national security, more so than people with Harvard PhDs. There are ranchers where we have missile facilities on their ranches. They consider that missile facility theirs. They'll call our local command post and say, hey, I see a green truck out by the missile. 
you guys get out there and check this guy out. So there are people, ranchers here, who take ownership of that missile on their property. Not everyone who had missiles placed on their land were happy about their presence, however. Lindy Kirkbride formed Wyoming Against the MX. It was my opinion that it was making the world less safe. I believe we should have a strong defense system. I just didn't want to have this incredible buildup of nuclear weapons and saying that our security is determined by these weapons of mass destruction that only could be used to, to destroy the earth. We asked missileers how the order to launch a missile was to be received and executed. If the president decides that it's time to expend a nuclear weapon, and he'll send the code over a series of communication systems that we have. You would receive those messages and you would decode them and validate them. And, and if it all checks out, then we start the process. We start the checklist to launch the weapon. To actually launch a missile, you turn a key and it takes two crew members to have one key turn here and one key turn over here and he's turning this key and the commander is up there turning that key and the keys have to be turned within a fraction of a second of one another and you can see that they're physically far enough apart that one individual can't turn both keys at the same time. And when the commander was ready he would say hands on keys the deputy would echo each step, and the commander would say, key turn on my mark, three, two, one, mark. And then both would turn their keys. That would put one vote in the system. You needed two votes to make the missile launch, another safeguard, which meant another crew in another capsule would have to key turn you know, in that same time frame, so a second vote would go to the missile. Flight times were classified on how long it would take to get to the target, but we used to joke about it uh, in those days, about uh, 30 minutes or less, or your next one's free, and that's roughly accurate. Stage one, very quick. Stage two, quick. Stage three, post boost vehicle, weapon off. One Peacekeeper missile could carry up to 10 nuclear warheads, all capable of being sent to different targets. It is estimated that just one of these warheads was 20 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan at the close of World War II. People are, would always say, you know, how can you, how could you do something like that? You know, it's just like my ass a soldier, could you really shoot at somebody? Well, if they're shooting at you, obviously that makes it easier. I thought about it often, sitting on alert, knowing that at my fingertips was this enormous destructive firepower. How could I actually launch if the president ordered me to launch? Well, the way that I viewed it was that our system works to the point that if the president decided that the only resort that he had to preserve the liberty and the integrity and the and, and the democracy that we enjoy, then I would have been convinced that he's exhausted all available means. And the only thing left was to launch a nuclear weapon. We asked if missileers ever launched their missiles, what they were supposed to do after. We had no plan after that. If, if you survive the war, it was, you know, you're on your own. Again, you know, what the top side would have looked like after a war, who knows. At the end of the capsule, there is a, an escape hatch there. And it looks like a manhole and there's a way to uh, take that manhole cover off and then there's sand in there and you're supposed to poke it out. But there really wasn't a, a, a plan that, okay, you'd come out of the capsule, come back to Cheyenne. That wasn't there. It was like, get out and look around, I guess. In 2005, Quebec One was decommissioned and the last Peacekeeper missile went off alert to meet conditions of the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty, or SORT. So there was an area up above and around uh, the launch control center itself. And one of the traditions was on your last alert, you would go up outside the access tunnel, you would pull yourself up above the capsule, and you would either write on top of the capsule or on the launch enclosure wall. Uh, you would just sign your name and your, your rank and the date of your last alert. We supported, you know, the rest of the world having that strength here. We did it, you know. We, uh, we, we prevented a nuclear war from happening. We did our job. Uh, it's certainly not pleasant duty in many times, especially for the the young kids who have to walk fence lines at two o'clock in the morning when it's snowing horizontally, but they do it willingly because they know what it contributes to national defense. And I was privileged to be able to serve in the 400th Missile Squadron and do a number of alerts at Quebec 01.